Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? Yo, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Matt, that's great. We're here another week. And Matt? Mm Mm-hmm. I know I saved this for the end of the show, but once again, want to thank you, as always, for joining me this week and editing the podcast, because Matt, Mm -hmm. Canadian Thanksgiving, and you know what I'm thankful for? What's that, Jared? Friendship. Oh, Jared, I'm thankful for friendship, too. Matt? Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you. You know who else I'm (laughs) thankful for, Matt? Who, Or thankful towards? Who? Our boy, Wallet Coon. Because Matt... (laughs) Wallet Coon takes some beatings. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Jared, I think this might be a very one sided relationship. <laughs> Where Wallet Coon, gotta give a shout out to him because Matt uh-huh. might, might have hurt him this oh, week no. once again with the release of Metaphor Refantasio. Because Matt, mm-hmm. spoilers to all our friends, even though. Uh, by the time they're listening to this, they can see not only the episode title, which will be metaphor adjacent, most likely, mm-hmm. uh, but just the timestamps will show a big chunk of this episode, most likely metaphor Revantasio. Enjoying that, but Matt, mm-hmm. <laughs> that was a pretty penny as well. But mm-hmm. you know who else I'm thankful for, Matt? Who, Jen? Got a shout out to Crazy Ollie. Uh, from Hollow Live Indonesia, she just celebrated her birthday, and with every Hollow Live or V2 for birthday, Matt, mm-hmm. there's the associated merch mm-hmm. that comes with it. Mm-hmm. And Matt, mm-hmm. I was, you know, just browsing the Hollow Live official store, yeah, and was looking at Ollie's birthday merch and thought, oh, this is pretty good, but you know buying straight from the hollow life store i think we've entertained the thought before but it was always the shipping that was a deterrent for us Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where alternatively we would have to go to i believe it was a geek jack to do our hollow live related purchases Mm -hmm. but i was scrolling through the birthday merch and i saw that when you purchase the ollie birthday set Mm-hmm. From the Hollow Live official store, it comes with a bonus. Matt, you know how Hollow Live's releasing their own TCG? Yeah, yeah. It comes with a bonus promo card of her birthday <laughs> outfit. Oh man! For said TCG, and mm-hmm. I thought that uh-huh. doesn't hurt to add it to the cart. You know what oh, I mean? Oh man, this guy, this guy. So I added it to the cart, mm-hmm. and I was thinking, oh, can't wait to see. I think. When we tried to, when the Hollow Life store started shipping internationally, we did it once and shipping was like $300 or something. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot. And I thought, okay, I'm going to see the $300 price tag and quickly close it. So Matt mm-hmm. put in my address, generated the shipping, and $30. Ooh, ooh. Jaren, that's, <laughs> Where... that's quite reasonable. <laughs> that's reasonable, Matt. That's reasonable. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I miss Kyla's birthday merch. So, <laughs> with, I mean, uh-huh. this comes with a promo card for in Japanese that I don't understand, but I can properly submit to PSA when they start accepting it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Matt, mm-hmm. you know, I had to click uh, place order, correct? <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. But, Matt, mm-hmm. didn't realize I had seven items. <laughs> In my cart already. Whoops. Oh, no, Jared. Matt, Uh I was going back and forth if I was going to not only tell you, but Uh all our friends listening on the Mistake Zone. But Matt, Mm -hmm. if I wasn't tainted before, Uh I think I'm tainted now. Because Matt, Uh in addition to Ollie's birthday set, Mm -hmm. that was seven voice packs. (laughs) From Hollow Live Talent. Ooh. Uh, Matt, mm-hmm. I am now a owner of Voice Packs. Ooh. Yep. And yep. I feel like I can't go back after this. Yep. Jen, gotta. It's going back to the old days of paying for MP3s. And Matt, mm-hmm. 
So, again, going to sound really suspicious right now, but Mm -hmm. this was part, well, seven instances from the Hololive, the four types of extreme love voice pack series. (laughs) And that, Uh Uh considering uh, that Myra Nikki Future Diary is top three anime to me, you know, Mm -hmm. I had to purchase seven of the English voiced uh, Yandere packs mm-hmm, mm-hmm, from mm-hmm. three from Hollow Live English members, uh, Elizabeth, Narissa, and Crony, and then four from Hollow ID in Zeta, Rene, Eofi, and Risu. And that mm-hmm. there's just something about you know going through all seven of them and how not only voice, like from a voice acting qualities perspective, I know. We you really get down to it, especially from the Hollow Live, you know, agency. Mm-hmm. They're essentially voice actors. Yeah, and I, I don't know why I was so surprised at the voice acting quality. <laughs> uh, while listening to this, you know, shout out to of course the EN girls, but even the ID girls, where you know the all self admittedly uh, English isn't their first language, but mm-hmm. even their English voice quality I thought was a pretty on the high side and i do like how they all kind of play into the campiness of this whole situation where i think i was you know entertaining the idea of oh this was pretty enjoyable do i look into the other en adjacent voice packs from this series but then i thought Mm -hmm. When you consider it's like some dairy and the other dairy types that aren't the yon dairy variety, uh-huh, uh-huh. I feel like when you leave the yon dairy camp, that's mm-hmm. kind of one too many steps in a direction that <laughs> I think would be less enjoyable uh-huh, to me, uh-huh. if that makes sense, where I'm not, <laughs> that goes into a different type of experience is all I'm going to say, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Where at least in the Yandere field, there's this element of corniness, campiness, and even cringeness, if you so to say, that I think from a piece of entertainment, I can say, oh, this is pretty funny. Where I think anything more, I don't know, romance adjacent might make me feel a bit weird. <laughs> ah, I see. I'm looking through like the voice facts that they have available right now yes. as well. And yeah, there is a lot of romance based what do you call it voice packs here i mean it it is from the four types of extreme love series but i would assume voice packs in general do go into that you know role play fantasy element where i think the yandere archetype is a bit you know it, it's still in that entertainment realm for me where again not not trying to yuck someone's yum mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but i feel like that's my that's where i sit on the voice pack fence where there's this level of distance uh, between me and said speaker. But sorry for cutting you Mm. off that. No, yeah, because I'm kind of just like looking at it and like one that's already kind of caught my eye just because it seems different from everything else that's on here is the Hololive English myth voice drama, Dawn of Time, The Weavers. And I'm kind of like interested in knowing what that is. Yeah, I, I feel like if the voice pack it because that's just radio drama. You can just yeah, go on yeah. to Spotify or wherever you get your podcast, wherever you find the mistake zone, <laughs> unless it's the website, and just get an audio drama where I think that's what I like. But when it's oh hey, let's go on the date type scenarios, I think that's hmm. not for me that. I'm not the target audience for that. (laughs) Jaren, do you think you're the target audience for Hololive Indonesia School Festival voice drama? Depends. Are we... (laughs) Are you going on a outing with each of the girls to the different stalls? Or, (laughs) Matt, stay Mm -hmm. with me here. Uh Are you quiet coon who has to help them set up for the festival and they're being really mad because you're lazy? (laughs) Oh, man. You know what? I can see you playing either way. Oh man, Matt! But oh. yes, I. Mm-hmm. What's up? Oh, I'm, I'm I'm looking at the Indonesia the school festival thing, and I'm surprised that like there are three sets, like one in Japanese, one in Indonesian, and one in English. 
Which, yeah, that's you know, like makes I, sense, but yeah, I appreciated that just because again, when I was looking through these, I picked anyone who was in English, but Matt mm-hmm. got to call out uh, one of my favorite Hollow Talents, Anya, where she provided hers in Indonesian and Japanese. No English version though. Ooh, made me feel bad. But Matt, <laughs> uh-huh. maybe I buy the Japanese version and <laughs> help me with my. <laughs> Matt, if I listen to Anya's Yandere Japanese voice pack, mm-hmm. do you think that will help me learn Japanese? I mean, I think it, I think it will help in some way. In some capacity, Matt. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Matt, enough about me hurting Wallet Coon. Mm-hmm. How have you been this week? I mean, Jaren, I think instead of hurting Wallet Coon, you know, like you said earlier, it is Canadian Thanksgiving uh, this this past weekend. And, you know, instead of hurting Wallet Coon, I was... I was hurting Tummy Coon. Matt. Uh huh. If there's one other uh, personified entity that I hurt on the regular, mm-hmm. <laughs> it is also our boy Tummy Coon. But Matt, mm-hmm. uh, what did you do to uh, TK this week? Jen, I uh, kind of just went out with my extended family for some all you can eat sushi. Oh, Matt. Mm-hmm. I dream about going to all you can eat sushi, but. Mm-hmm. I feel like this aging vessel of flesh isn't up to the tasks, but Matt, mm-hmm. how do you fare in all you can eat sushi in 2024? Jaren, I, you know, I, I think I, my age is, is showing my limits now and I, I definitely can't, you know, scarf down as much sushi as I used to, but. Oh, that's Jaren, unfortunate, Matt. Mm-hmm. I was, okay, so I went out for a lunch all you can eat uh, sushi. And, you know, usually the menus are kind of different from that. And I was really surprised to see that, like, places are serving sashimi at lunch now. Ooh, that, is that a fancy place you went to, Matt? Because that sounds sacrilegious to me. Jared, it was, I mean, it's like a, I think, brand here in Ontario, probably, or like our part of, like, Ontario, like, uh, Art Heart Sushi. Mm-hmm. I was surprised that they have sashimi at lunch because, you know, sashimi, from my remembrance of uh, All You Can Eat Sushi, which I... I feel like I really haven't gone through that much ever since, you know, pandemic. But that used to be exclusively for for dinner. That's how they, like, you know, they pull you into dinner. Yeah. Even when I remember our time going to hard sushi for the lunch period, never sashimi from what mm-hmm. I recall. Jaren, the fact that they have sashimi at lunchtime now is really tempting me into going back. Matt, mm-hmm. if I'm in the area one of these days... <laughs> Maybe I need to put TK to the task. Oh, man. I have to, you know, renew my, my licenses and my, like, health cards and passports soon. And think maybe I'll just make a day of it, you know, get those uh, renewed and then and then go for some uh, all you, solo all-you-can-eat sushi. Let me know when, Matt, and I'll tell you if I'm in the area. Oh, but man. Mm-hmm. We started this in the, you know, with the topic of you hurt TK. Mm-hmm. Matt? Mm-hmm. What damage was done when you went to All You Can Eat Sushi? Ooh, food-wise, uh, I think just me, I I did at least seven pieces of vegetable tempura. Matt, uh, mm-hmm. Matt you can't do that at our Jared, age anymore. I really, really like uh, veggie tempura. Um, same. Like, same. you know, the tempura, what do you call it? Tempura zucchini and tempura eggplant are some of my favorite things to, like, get at a... A Japanese place. Fair. Um, you know, I did. I did my. You know, the sashimi being there. I did. I. I think I did like twenty five pieces of sashimi. Hmm. That. that mm-hmm. I mean, if you're paying that much, gotta go all out mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to gotta the best of your ability. Out. Gotta go all out. You know, did a set of uh, golden California. Did a set of salmon avocado. Did a set of spicy salmon. Of course. Mm. You know, just going through the classic. Going yeah, the through classics, the greatest the hits at this point. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Jaren. This place also had, you know, of course, like, I I think a lot of all-you-can-eat places now, you know, venture away from being strictly Japanese. So, you know, also got me some tofuki, got me some uh, uh, pad thai. <laughs> Jared, I, whenever I see the non-Japanese stuff at an all-you-can-eat sushi place, I always feel very tempted to, to go see how they're doing it. Especially something very specific tasting like pad thai. I was like, when we went to Anime Ramen and... Spain just to see what the other Asian adjacent food was like, Matt. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Matt, you run the gauntlet, and I'm mm-hmm. proud of you because that seems like a spread we would be enjoying 10 years ago. Yeah. But yeah. Mm-hmm. have to ask. Mm-hmm. Got a part of my French, but uh, how was Toilet Coon afterwards? Oh, man, Jared, it was <laughs> not good. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, man. Jared, Jared, I think it was, you know, the what you would expect from, from heavy, heavy eating of, uh, you know, a lot of meat and a lot of, I guess, like, grain and fiber to yep. for for that that uh toilet experience of course and not mm-hmm. but you made it through made it through. you showed up free confirmed that you can still you still got it at this mm-hmm. age mm-hmm. and i i find it comforting knowing that we both had sushi adjacent thanksgiving weekends where while we didn't have the all you can eat variety mm-hmm. we did matt surprise Go to Costco uh, beforehand. You know, had to pick up a pumpkin pie, of course. And I'm not sure if it's available in the Costco's near the Saturday morning arcade clubhouse. But in one in the Costco's near the Mistake Zone HQ, they have the poke, not the poke bowls, but the in I guess the deli, the pre meal section. It, it's just a container of tuna, basically. And we picked that up. We also picked up, you know, the $13 uh, tray of crab rolls and spicy crab rolls and that. Mm -hmm. Made Mm -hmm. our own poke bowls. And that was our Thanksgiving where the new poke containers or whatever um, from Costco, pretty good, Matt pretty good but it's one of those if you're not eating it the day of or the day after not you're pushing it yeah is all i'm gonna yeah. say i mean i feel like that's all all sushi should probably be eaten the day that you decide to buy, yep. buy it but luckily uh i'm not vomiting into a toilet right mm-hmm. now so mm-hmm. we're good to go for this episode of the mistake zone but matt mm-hmm. good way to waste uh <laughs> 15, 20 minutes, but I feel Mm -hmm. like we need to talk about some news that, you know, is once again related to our interest in that. Mm -hmm. This came from the Gundam Twitter a few hours ago, but Matt? Yes. There's going to be a Gundam Cross Hatsune Miku anniversary special project where... Uh, You know, the two companies plan to hold various collaborations such as music and project scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they're going to offer a wide variety of products and services. Uh, So far, they've only released the logo and ask fans to look forward for future information releases where Matt, Mm -hmm. Gundam, you know, a special place in our hearts, Hatsune Miku, special place in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Gotta ask, Matt, with only a logo being shared so far, yes. what do you want to see out of this Gundam Cross Hatsune Miku anniversary special project? I mean, personally, I really, really hope that they have some kind of actual Miku Gundam instead right. of um, what they do with, I feel like, a lot of collabs, which is a like crossover color. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want a Miku colored Gundam. I want a Gundam that has Miku parts. I mean, the classic Twin Tails you have to have. Yes. Or some variety. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a Gundam called Noble Gundam, which is a Gundam that looks like it has Twin Tails and a schoolgirl outfit. And I feel like that is the most likely candidate for one of the crossovers. Or if this crossover like is including, um, you know, mobile suits. But I mm-hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but there's always this I don't know, I guess it's been a custom paint job of whenever I think of a Hatsune Miku Gundam, I I guess I'm thinking of a noble with a custom Miku colorway. Mm-hmm. Where one I guess my question to you, Matt, is I, I think you know which one I'm talking about or which image I'm talking about. But one, is that the Noble Gundam? And two, has it 
is the Noble Gundam's colorway sort of similar to Amiku, or is that just you know a custom thing in general? No, it the the color for the Noble Gundam is like the very standard Gundam colors of like you know white mm-hmm. that kind of like strong blue color and red and yellow. Right, right. So it's yeah. like very far away from um, you know standard Miku colors, but. Since the Noble Gundam does have a very schoolgirl like outfit and it does have, you know, hair, I guess, it, it does cross over into Miku very easily. Okay. Where I know the tweet itself says various collaborations such as music and mm-hmm. product scenes. On the music side, are you thinking potentially covers of Gundam songs in the Vocaloid style? Or are you thinking more kind of unique original pieces for this collab honestly i would expect maybe one original unique piece for this collab Mm -hmm. but i am kind of expecting a lot of um like hatsune miku or just like you know vocaloid in general style covers of popular gundam openings and closings and you know like the related music um which is kind of standard when you're mm -hmm, collabing mm -hmm. with hatsune miku at this point one of the things i actually like in inside the kind of a uh, teaser photo or the promotional photo for this picture, uh, on the Gundam side it does show a kind of a horror, um in mm-hmm. the kind of Miku style, and I also wouldn't be surprised if they just have a kind of Miku styled horror. Right. But the thing that I really really hope that if they decide to go with that particular piece of merch, is I believe I talked about this when on the on my trip to Japan episode. But I hope that the Haro, if it is Miku themed, it is also Miku voiced. Hmm. Because I, I I believe I talked about the automaton, the Miku automaton, yep. and how I saw it when I was, you know, just like at a Don Quixote, and I was really, really considering buying it. But, you know, it was about like 6,000 yen, so about like sixty dollars Canadian, and that is like at a price where I was like, okay, you know, maybe I should like look into this first to make sure it's worth it. And I was so disappointed to know that it is only Miku themed and not Miku sounding. Right. Yeah, I remember like, you telling me yeah, about this. Which is like, you know, I feel like most of the reason that I would even want to have this one in particular is just to have that at least. I know because. Miku technically has a seiyuu attached, but mm-hmm. when you're really thinking about the actual Vocaloid Miku or how it's synthesized, you really do want that specific sound. Yeah, I get that, Matt. I get mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But Where, yeah. in addition to, you know, I'm expecting the standard acrylic sets, you know, posters, prints, and whatnot. But yeah, I'm really curious to see when you collab with Gundam, the first thought is, oh, is there going to be models? Is there going to be figures? Is there going to be sets? So I think that's the thing I'm most excited for. I think music is kind of secondary, depending on which producers they do get involved in this project. If they, you know, do reach out to some notable Vocaloid producers mm-hmm. or just remix, um, Gundam song or classic Gundam songs that you know you would kind of expect, but yeah, I'm really curious to see where this goes. The logo is pretty nice, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, really no information, just speculation right now. So I think when the official you know images and releases start coming out, we'll probably talk about that again. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. now that we're in the anime adjacent zone. Gotta go with our weekly uh, da don don or don da don. Uh, Matt, mm-hmm. don't know how to pronounce it. Dan da dan, but gotta talk about the adventures of Ken and Ayasi. Don da don, episode two. And Matt, mm-hmm. uh, just real quick this week, I really did like episode two just because after our discussion last week, uh, now that you kind of you know gave the context that this might be more a romance. Um, anime first with the shonen elements a bit second. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, having that mindset going into it really makes me appreciate the character interactions between Ken and Ayasi. Uh, I know here they're still trying to find Turbo Granny, but this whole episode re- um, takes place in Ayasi's house. And I was actually really surprised at 
you know, them slowly building their relationship, learning more about one another, and, you know, just how bashful Ken is about, you know, entering Ayase's home, and just how, even though she's still on guard towards him, how she's still showing that compassion, considering all that's happened to the between the two, uh, which was nice, but... I feel like for a majority of the episode, it does slip back into that shonen, I guess, expectation that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think the casual uh, viewer is kind of expecting based on the trailers that the that have been shown mm-hmm. uh, previously, where for the most part, this episode was pretty action-packed. You know, it is them dealing with a alien ghost Matt I I don't Mm. actually know the relationship between aliens and ghosts uh yet and hopefully they do explain that in the show but for the most part for a majority of the episode just to be them fighting and trying to outsmart this giant sumo alien ghost I thought it was really on point we're seeing again Ken trying to not only master his newfound power but I do like the element of uh I still, even though I can kind of utilize it, I still can't. Mm -hmm. So to actually see him fail, uh, to go all in, but still come up short just because, you know, he's only had this power for a few hours. I think that's a, you know, trait of the shounen manga genre that I do appreciate. Plus, we do see Ayasi get her hands dirty. Matt, she takes some really uh, brutal punches from the sumo alien, which, Mm -hmm. again, just shows how tough she gets as well. But overall, another great episode. I didn't expect me to be into it so much, but looking forward to next week. Uh, But there's one trope that this episode does that I'm always a sucker for. And Matt, Mm -hmm. God ask what you think of this trope where when they're in Ayasi and her grandmother's house, um, she hears a doorbell and Ken thinks, oh, is that, isn't that your uh, grandmother? But Ayasi, she starts sweating. She starts freaking out and she says, no, uh, this house has two doorbells, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the normal one and then the secondary one that ghosts and the occult and those entities use. And, Whenever that doorbell rings, something bad's going to happen. And Matt, Mm -hmm. I love that trope in anime or in entertainment in general of the second doorbell equivalent. And you know that something's going to go down. And I don't know, Matt, Uh how do you feel about the secondary doorbell? Jaren, I honestly didn't know that was a trope. Really? Jaren, I honest right now, I'm not really able to think of a secondary doorbell in any other, I guess, like, media. I guess it's not necessarily the secondary doorbell per se, but that instance of, hey, this is a alternate door knock, this is a secret code, but essentially a signifier to say, oh, something, even though it might appear normal to some of the other characters, to Mm -hmm. that one central character, that alternate knock that alternate um i don't know the postcard going underneath the door uh just to signify oh something's wrong here and i don't know maybe it's because i've also been watching a lot of uh campy horror movies and the equivalent to that is not necessarily a secondary doorbell but the slip up i guess to let you know that oh something's going down here I don't know. Maybe I'm just ranting, but I love the secondary doorbell here just because I like that signifier of if you know, you know, something's going down. And of Mm -hmm. course, something goes down in this episode. But uh, Matt, did you check out episode two or are you just kind of uh, checked out of the anime now? I mean, I did like check it out because I heard that it was like, you know, very well animated, especially when you compare it to other episode twos of uh, this season. Oh but. man, we're gonna get into uh, Yuzimaki at some point, but oh, not man. not this week. Not this week. Also, you know, if if you want to talk about uh, bad animation, we can talk about uh, PowerPoint Blue Lock episode two. Oh, uh, that mm-hmm. is that a uh, fall season anime now? That is a fall season. Yeah, it just started, and 
Jaren, that honestly, that was a very, very rough episode. <laughs> how, how so? Uh, you could mistake it for, honestly, I think just like manga at some point, to be honest. Uh, it was very much a slideshow, especially during the actual soccer segments, which is, I think, the place you don't want to be doing that. Oh, that's actually really rough, Matt. Mm-hmm. Where mm-hmm. is it a notable? I mean, so for this episode of Dawn to Dawn, mm-hmm. you know, that fight is pretty much what 60% of the episode. Yeah. Maybe even 70. Uh, for Blue Lock episode two, how much of that episode is dedicated to Slideshow Soccer? Um, I think that whole episode is Slideshow Soccer. That's rough, Matt. Yeah, that's Jared, rough. Especially since I decided to go look at that Blue Lock episode because I wanted to see. Okay, their first episode, the art style looked very, very nice. I was like, you know, really excited to see that they upped the art style. So I was really excited to see how they're going to up the soccer. And for the first episode to have bad, or the first soccer episode to have bad soccer animation is a really, really bad call. Matt, mm-hmm. what's up with episode two this season? I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, you know, you know. Let, let, let's stay on track with uh, Don the Don. All right. But, yeah, again, really like the animation. Really, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. maybe light spoilers, but, you know, we have Ken. His name is Ken, right? Yeah. Oda Kuhn or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, him going into transforming into his Super Saiyan alternative. Yeah. And that yeah. being a moody teen. Mm-hmm. Is that a characteristic of Ken's transformation moving forward? Do we continue to see um, moody teen Ken or does it fluctuate without really getting too much into it? Jared, I honestly can't remember that well. Because mm-hmm. uh, like I did read it like, you know, around the time it was coming out. But yeah, that 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 particular thing I can't remember. Okay. But any thoughts on the episode, Matt, before we move on? I mean, I like the episode. I, I thought, like, this was a very, very well-animated episode, and I'm sure that it is going to probably stay this way for the rest of the season. And I, okay. I'm going to definitely be, you know, poking my head back in every so often to see how the how it's looking. All right. Maybe I'll continue with my weekly check-ins just to see. But mm-hmm. uh, real quick... I, we did see a movie this week. We did see Look Back. And I know we're going to wait for Rakush to, uh, once his setup is okay, for him to come on. And then we'll talk to him about Look Back as well. But um, until then, I do really recommend it. If you're looking for a easygoing, maybe easygoing is not the right term. But, you know, it has a one hour, 15 minute runtime. So if you're looking for a slice of life that celebrates not you know one of my favorite things friendship Mm -hmm. and you know just creating manga in general uh and even just seeing the passion that someone can have i do recommend look back um and i think we'll save that the rest of my thoughts for when rakush comes in and before we get to the main event matt Mm -hmm. I've also been, quote-unquote, playing a new idol game this week. Not really new. Mm -hmm. New to me, at the very least. And Mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. I've been playing Idol Slayer on Steam. And, you know, you this came out in December 2020. Uh, Apparently, it still gets updates. But I was looking for an idol game, you know, I-D-L-E, not I-D-O-L. But, Matt, Mm -hmm. maybe I'd play a game called Idol Slayer as well. But... (laughs) This is your tried and true, hey, numbers go up. Uh, You want to essentially get power-ups and then you eventually, it's called uh, ascending, but it's your prestige system where Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is pretty common in all idol games where you hit your prestige, you hit your ascension, and then you can spend another currency to get more meta uh, passives that will benefit your runs. And, you know, it's the standard, okay, when I'm, you know, when the game's on, I'm getting my coins, I'm slashing monsters, and when the game's off, I'm getting a percentage of said coins. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you turn it off, come back in, get your upgrades. It has some really fun pixel graphics. I really do like the backing tracks when I am kind of listening and need to do something mindless and... It is one of those games where 
it does reward some activity just because when you're running around, you know, you're kind of just slashing in front of you when you do get to an enemy. But occasionally there are coins just floating around. There are bees that you have to jump for. And eventually you can get different portals that are when you trigger them uh, because, you know, you don't get them on your passive runs. But when you trigger mm-hmm. them, you go into said portal and there are different mechanics like, oh, here's the platform one where you have to time your jumps properly to collect items and then get rewards and um so it does reward some activity but for the most part you are tapping just to jump that's the extent of your combat of hey Mm -hmm. i need to jump and kill this wasp or i need to jump and get these coins where this is a free-to-play idle game it is available on you know your mobile devices with cloud saves but you have to kind of register for a cloud account Mm -hmm. and i believe the mobile version does have ads this has in-game purchases but if you're looking for something to watch the numbers go up and if you want a you know quick dopamine hit of unlocking 48 achievements within the first 10 minutes of play Uh uh, check out idol slayer if you want to see numbers go up matt but Mm -hmm. There's another game we've been seeing numbers go up, uh, albeit to a lesser degree. But Matt, Mm -hmm. as we alluded to in the beginning of the episode, uh, Metaphor Refantasio, the new Atlas JRPG, out for real, for real. Matt, Mm -hmm. I think I'm still, I put in around 10 hours so far, but I'm kind of... I'm at the point of the first dungeon where you meet the boss and he does some shenanigans where you have to turn back from now. Matt, how far am I from completing the dungeon? Um, That is about like halfway through-ish. Maybe a bit, like maybe like the 60% way through. And you can still finish this in the first day, correct? Yeah, I, yeah, I finished it in the first day. Yeah. Okay. All, all the dungeons are, are one day a bowl. Well... That makes sense to, if you know, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, that will make sense to you. But Matt, Mm -hmm. you've put in more time. You've seen more than the demo at this point. So yes, as Mm -hmm. the, as metaphor, Matt, Uh Matt, Uh how is your first dozen, two dozen or so hours of metaphor refantasio now that it's out? Jared, I'm I'm really really enjoying this. Um, it is a nice change of pace from the standard Persona setting of you know just Japan in general. Yep. Uh, even though it is literally following the exact same <laughs> formula, but yeah, like you know, Jared, I'm enjoying. It. I I actually really am interested in the uh, story for this game. Okay. Because I. I'm interested in seeing where it's going. In particular, kind of like the turn of the main character. Because, you know, obviously the main character is at some point going to be, you know, a real candidate for for kingship. Assuming that they don't, you know, somehow end the game being king or whatever. Right. And I'm really interested in seeing the kind of turning point of kind of first off, like when the main character and the party become more prominent Mm -hmm. and when you know the antagonists start to see them as like a threat and how people are going to be reacting to you know like basically this lower class like person becoming you know prominent throughout the world and seeing how like this game does seem to be a lot about you know changing basically racial perception and i'm interested in seeing how that kind of thread or theme is going to grow throughout the game where we do understand this is a new game and we're going to tread really really lightly in terms Mm -hmm. of story spoilers where i don't I, i think anything major we dive into will have happened within let's say the demo period or um by the end or wherever i'm at of the first dungeon so still quote unquote early on in the game even though this takes place within the first 10 hours or so but it is a interesting dynamic 
playing through the beginning of Metaphor Ray Fantasio because there are these meta elements to it that don't necessarily spoil the story in itself, but kind of allude to what's happening just because, Mm -hmm. you know, in another life, Matt, you saying that, oh, the main character is kind of primed for, quote unquote, kinghood or, you know, for people to see him as this authoritative figure where I'm curious how it, it gets to that point just because on one hand for where I am at the story and really early on, that's not the intention of you or your party. That's kind of far from their cause because they Mm -hmm. have a specific goal that they want to do. And yet I don't know if this is the fault of just you of tutorial or whatnot, but it's the fact that that, you saying that doesn't surprise me because the game through its tutorial kind of preps you to know that's the direction it's heading to because early on you're being told hey your popularity your perception Mm -hmm. will really benefit you and your cause and ultimately how society sees you where I think that was enough for me to realize, oh, they're going to prime me to be king at some point. And Mm -hmm. now I'm curious to see how you get there, where uh, before we get into the specifics, I I was just curious for you playing early on, Matt, did you get these kind of inklings that, oh, I'm your character is with is the one essentially in a classic RPG setting just based on some of the tutorial and the tips you're given? I mean, yeah, sort of. I think it's just the kind of idea of, you know, it is a video game and you're you're playing as the main character, so obviously you need to go do something cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I did initially kind of like think, oh, I wonder how they're going to raise the perception of the prince, Right, But then at some point, they kind of like give you this mechanic before they really even talk about it. L- like you said, something like related to your popularity. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's going to be the main character instead is how they're yeah. going to like push this story. But like I am interested in seeing if they somehow reverse it to the original goal of, you know, making the prince be the, the relevant one somehow. Because, right. you know, this is using basically just, you know, <laughs> moon magic for the most part. For the most part. But I think we've been talking in circles with that. And now that you've had a lot of time, well, not a lot of time, but some substantial time with the game, Matt. Mm -hmm. uh, My first question to you is, now that you've played through the full release, was there anything from the demo that you completely, I guess, changed your thoughts on, changed your mind on, did a 188? with having the real game i think maybe the archetypes are one of the things that i've kind of changed my thoughts on a lot Mm -hmm. um because jaren the archetype grind is is real yes (laughs) um like getting those archetypes to to 20 is is taking a while for everybody and jaren at the very start the mag costs are i think like not too imposing Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, once you get to, like, I guess, like, you know how you're doing everything, it's like, oh, you're doing light damage to everything. But once you start getting to the point where you're doing, oh, you're doing medium damage uh, spells or whatever, the the costs kind of, like, skyrocket to the yeah. point where I wish I didn't kind of, like, frivol- frivolously spend my mag at the start. Fair. Um, where mm. I think, you know, going to the you know, grinding your archetypes and leveling them up because I believe the max level for an archetype is level 20. And yes. early on, more, uh, you know, the Velvet Room, your Igor equivalent, it gives you a quest to, hey, can you raise um, the healer to archetype rank 10? Yeah. And I feel like playing the Persona games has made me expect something that really isn't in the game yet 
And as you, as I kind of asked you, Matt, I'm like 60% through in the first dungeon. And I quickly realized that, that the dungeons here don't work like they do in Persona in that I don't know if this changes, and I guess that's what I'm asking you, but can you grind in these dungeons? Because in the, say, the Persona games, if I went to the next floor and then went back, all of the enemies would respawn. But for the most part, I'm only finding that you have to keep a trance crystal um, alive to have some sort of monster respawn. But even then, they're not of the same quality as you would expect as the normal enemies on that floor, if that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. uh, Matt, how do you grind in this game? So, I think it is a lot through keeping trans crystals around because mm -hmm. in... So, I've done two major dungeons and I've done a couple of minor dungeons. And every major dungeon has had the trans crystals that you can, you know, grind on assuming you don't destroy them. Mm -hmm. And... Maybe, like, I want to say a bit less than half of the minor dungeons have had uh, trans crystals in them to, to grind on. But the enemies do respawn. Um, I don't know. I think maybe they're on a timer or oh, okay. you have to leave the dungeon and, like, go to, you know, that, like, kind of, like, load-in room where more shadow is and then all your companions are standing around like at the very very start of the dungeon okay. I think you need to exit to that point and come back in if you want to hit um a monster like a proper monster respawn because i find that that is or when i do that it brings most of them back but i don't know if it's like that doing it or if i just elapse the timer you know getting back to the entrance and coming back in okay and I guess that's my issue is I'm playing this like I would play a Persona and mm -hmm. it's not working like Persona. So that's making yeah. me a bit, not annoyed per se, but you know me, Matt, I like to grind in these games. Yeah, but... I think grinding does become slightly easier in terms of um, alternate archetypes later on mm -hmm. because once you get an archetype to level 20, they can continue to gain experience. And then every 1,000 experience that they gain, they create one of those hero items. Um, oh, And nice. you can basically just, like, once it generates 1,000 experience, it dumps that 1,000 experience into the, an item. And then you can use that item on anybody's archetype for That's any archetype you have. Yeah. So, you know, you, you don't have to kind of, like, do the thing where, oh, I'm going to switch out my archetype and let that grind up. Um like towards the end of the game like at the start i did do that for the healer because i thought it would be faster because you know didn't really have anything at 20 to generate those items but it is nice to know that like even if i have a character at their you know max level for an archetype they will continue to generate experience for themselves and other characters okay matt mm -hmm. speaking about leveling up where are you pumping uh the stats for <laughs> mc jared's all magic baby <laughs> Yep, yep. Same. Jared, I'm surprised at how... You know, I know that, like, in other games, you usually do have the kind of, like, drip of one character per major dungeon. Yep. But I feel like... And it is still kind of doing that here, but they don't give you the initial set of four to start with. Mm -hmm. So it feels like I don't have a good, you know, variation in party members. Right, Because, you know, while you can give anybody any archetype, they are going to skew more to archetypes that are more relevant to their stats. Yes. And, you know, it's unfortunate that, like, I have some archetypes where I don't really have anyone to fill this role. And, like, especially at the start, um, you don't really, like, neither Stroll or, um, what is it, Hild Hild Hildenberg? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, neither of the... Neither of them have, um, you know, really good magic. So it's kind of rough to use the mage with either of them. Yeah, I know right now I'm rolling a mage for the MC just because in the first dungeon, 
Uh, all the skeletons are weak to, at least the skeletons from the trans crystals are weak to the mage uh, basic attack. And that's how, mm-hmm. you know, you gain your MP here. Mm-hmm. But I'm actually really curious, without going to spoilers with who you meet, uh, Matt, when do you get your next party member? And are you only limited to a three person party? Uh, no, the party size is uh, four, mm-hmm. um, you know, which is like, I think, like, as expected for this type of game. But you get the next party member like around around the second dungeon ish. And then okay. depending on what you're doing, you may or you know may not have them earlier. But you'll Fair. you'll get them like around that point. And Jaren, this game does a thing that I don't like that games games do, which is that it it really it 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 highlighted a point where. I wish the characters themselves had abilities outside oh. of um, the archetype you assigned them, yeah. and it's very prominent on the um, <laughs> on the fourth party member that you get because you know before you ever get them, you kind of like you know meet them in a way that you are doing like fights with them, mm-hmm. and they have you know, skills that they can use that are just gone once you have them as a party member. That's unfortunate. Like, yeah. I really wish really they cool didn't do to that. have those two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where I think that's what kind of threw me off in the demo and now playing through the game, where, as you said, since you are, since you can reassign archetypes that are unlocked on the fly, it sort of makes everyone sort of, feel the same if that makes sense i know stat wise as you said each Mm -hmm. person is kind of geared towards specific archetypes but at the same time when you have this freedom i don't know it's kind of weird where maybe i just need to unlock more party members to see this play out but you know i don't have gyrus on my team right Mm -hmm. now but Mm -hmm. at the same time it's not like he left if that makes sense just because his role was filled right away, but he didn't have a definite role for me to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I think that's sort of what's missing for me in exchange for the freedom of changing all the different archetypes. Not that it's a bad thing per se, but again, I feel like switching the different archetypes kind of... The characters lose some sort of unique this to them but maybe mm-hmm. that's something that will kind of clear up for me the more i play but matt mm-hmm. when so you've done a few major dungeons so far uh and a few minor dungeons now coming from persona where the dungeons aren't necessarily the strong suit of the games uh-huh. how do the metaphor dungeons compare uh to the persona games and how do you just like them in general now that you've done a bunch I mean, I think they're very standard dungeons. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think they're as kind of like elaborately designed as Persona 5 dungeons. Right. Um, I think they're more so along the lines of a Persona 4 style dungeon where, you know, it's kind of themed with light puzzles and there's like no, I guess like, um, like, I think like the Persona 5 dungeons in my head have a kind of like cinematographic nature to them. That, Just because um, they're based on, yeah, you know, they're palaces at that point. Yeah, they're kind yeah. of based on someone's intern, like what they feel internally. Where mm-hmm. I think that's what also I was curious about going into metaphor, where this is a pretty, you know, this is a fantasy game at its core. Yeah, and the different dungeons would relate to you know the different regions, the different countrysides, but. With something like Persona, you're getting such drastic dungeons. And I know it's unfair of me to compare it to Persona so much, but Mm -hmm. when it comes to that dungeon variety, do they keep it fresh every time you've been to a new one? Or do they fit to the time period, I guess? They are very much like of the time period so far. It very much is, oh, here's a dungeon in a desert. Here's a dungeon in a castle. Here's a dungeon... You know, in a in like a church, like in a field right. or whatever. 
like they are very much limited to the kind of medieval palette, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, so it, it's kind of what I expected, but at the same time, I feel like the style and its overall aesthetic still carry it in a way where even if you're not getting these contrasting dungeons, you're still getting something out of it. And I think mm-hmm. where it might lack in terms of you know dungeon variety, it's the fact that we're not really dealing with kids in Japan, yeah. but you're dealing with these different characters of different walks of life where Matt... Mm-hmm. Now that you've met a few more characters, how do you feel about the character design metaphor so far? Oh, I actually really like the character design. Um, I think everybody that they've, you know, added to your, not only your party, but like within your bonds as well, are mm-hmm. all very interesting characters. Something that I actually really like is that almost every time that you add somebody to, you know, your core crew, whether they are, you know, a party member or like kind of like an adjacent person to your crew they all look at your book yeah and i like having everybody's kind of opinion on you know basically democracy yeah and and how they feel about it i think that's like a very you know fun ad for uh, all the characters okay and Mm -hmm. i think from a design point everyone so far i really do like how striking their color palettes can be yeah you know a stroll you know i i do like his jacket <laughs> that's where uh-huh. his color comes in uh-huh. but you know even meeting something like uh katharina mm-hmm. um just seeing how vibrant she is in such uh you know it the world so far from what i've played is pretty muted in a way just and to see her pop out in the first dungeon, I don't know. I thought yeah. I really did enjoy it as well. I think that's something I'm very excited about for Metaphor. Because mm-hmm. I think, you know, looking back at looking back at Persona 3, Persona 4, and like 5, I basically knew everybody who is in the party for the most yeah. part. And I feel like I don't have that knowledge for Metaphor. Right, Like, there are characters where I'm like, oh, like, this person has to be joining the party at some point. But I'm, like, not sure on, like, people who are who are going to be joining the party at some point. We're, I'm, I don't know how this will play out, but, you know, consider Grius again mm-hmm. and how you, early on in the game, you awaken that heroic archetype within him. Mm -hmm. And I do know where you're coming from, where you meet all these different characters, you do the handshake, and you create bonds with them. But for sometimes they become a party member. Uh, More oftentimes than not, they don't become a party member. They're just a bond. Mm -hmm. Where, again, going to that, you lose your, that uniqueness per character within combat. The fact that everyone can or your party can switch between all these different archetypes i'm curious okay i i kind of know the answer to this but considering what they did with great grius or garris or whatever his name was Mm -hmm. is why i don't know why a lot more people aren't playable if that makes sense if you're able to awaken people's archetypes and the fact that Everyone shares I get archetypes. No one has really unique combat abilities uh, to their character. Maybe weapon types, but even weapon types can change depending on the archetype. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just curious why a lot. Then again, I I, I don't, haven't progressed in this game at all, but it feels like it sets you up for this. <laughs> this is going to be a weird pull. This watchdog legion type <laughs> environment of maybe i can awaken anyone and any npc can be my fr- or my battle partner because i can mm. give them an archetype and all the archetypes look the same it's just a different color palette so I mean, it is also a kind of a case of you know Grius wanted to fight or he was like a part of the fight which yeah. i think is a little different in terms of like you know comparing it to something like watchdogs or like you know something where you can recruit anyone because <laughs> I feel like you know if you if you give like I don't know Maria uh, uh, an archetype, 
she probably shouldn't, you know, probably shouldn't go <laughs> go fight with uh, the rest of the crew. Yeah, I give you that, Matt. But the first time I saw Fabian, Matt, you know, I wanted her <laughs> in the party real, real bad. Oh man, yo, Jaren, Jaren, there's still a lot of game left. Maybe, maybe she'll uh, join. Maybe she'll join. Fair enough. Fair enough, Matt. But yeah, I again, I do like the palette of a lot of the characters I've met so far. I do like a lot of the characters I'm meeting. Uh, but Matt, I know we're going <laughs> to be light on spoilers, but there's before we get into specifics, now that I've opened the floodgates, mm-hmm. uh, Matt, mm-hmm. the Gre- Grius, our yes. boy Grius. Yes. I, I, I should have picked up on this in the demo. And I do admit at the very least that in the demo and in the full game itself, when you're given the ability to awaken Grius's, you know, inner heroic archetype. Mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. I thought one, that was weird, but two, considering how the first dungeon plays out, man, are the Grius death flags really, <laughs> oh, really yeah. obvious. Oh, like yeah. Matt, mm-hmm. on paper, uh-huh. l- let's go through them. Okay. Um, he doesn't seem to have his own when you meet him. He doesn't give you an archetype path. Yeah. Yeah. You have to awaken it in him yourself. Mhm. Not. Uh-huh. He has a daughter? Yep. He has a not wife. Yeah. And his daughter wishes that he can stay and play with her. Uh-huh. Not, <laughs> I feel like the greatest uh-huh. It, it was really on the nose. Uh-huh. Really on the nose. Uh-huh. And then that, uh-huh. the twist uh, early on in the first dungeon when you have to fight his reanimated corpse, I thought, mm-hmm. <laughs> was just downright insulting to Fabian and Marie. Matt, what did you think of Grius? <laughs> Jared, I, you know, the the not the him not having his own kind of archetype path really didn't yep. stick out to me. Because, you know, that's kind of... You're still kind of like establishing, um, I guess like game, game internalized like logic or like you know yeah. game character meta, which, Jaren. Okay, I, I'll let me talk about this like later. But man, Jaren, there is there is some stuff about bosses in this game that I I really don't like how they, um, I guess established established learning in this game. But okay, going back to Grius, yeah. Once I got to Grand Trad. And you start meeting his daughter, and I'm like, "Oh, cool! Oh, oh, she has like a like missing mom." I was like, "Oh, okay." You know that that's pretty sad. Here's our here's our Nanako for for you know this game, and I mm-hmm. I think like yeah, around that point as well is when I started really really seeing his death flags, um, yeah. and how stubborn he was <laughs> about trying to kill Luis. I, I thought maybe that, you know, up until the point where they kind of like hatched a plan to just, you know, stab Luis while he's he's on the platform or whenever they see him or whatever. I thought maybe he gets sidelined and he becomes, you know, the the injured mentor character. And that's when he establishes like his own archetype. But I don't know. Once they like were really set on that plan, I, I was like, oh, this guy's going to die. <laughs> yep. And Matt, Mm -hmm. now that we're kind of in light spoiler territory, again, early on, you probably do this in the demo. I can't confirm because I never finished the demo. Mm -hmm. So we go into the plan. We're in Grand Trad. It's the uh, funeral for the king. And then Matt, Uh the castle or the kingdom flies into the air. Uh, The king becomes a rock moon thing. Yes. And... The game goes from zero to a hundred, and yeah. in Giris trying to kill Luis, the king binds him, and in turn, Luis is able to kill Grius. Mm-hmm. Where mm-hmm. Not, maybe this king isn't the best <laughs> of uh, characters at that moment, but when you saw the king fate rock face for the first time, what was going through your head? I was honestly just thinking of Majora's Mask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like I, I really like that escalation of story mm-hmm. because like I really, 
personally wasn't looking forward to just like a standard kind of like power struggle with Luis. Yeah. Um, so I'm really glad that it the story decided to go in this direction instead. Where I think it was at this moment where I was really sold on the story, just because you know you have the comparisons that a lot of people have thrown around of oh this is Game of Thrones, this is you know this is Succession, this is struggle for the throne, mm-hmm. and I thought okay that's all well and good, but it's the fact that you have this king who becomes this moon monster, essentially. Yeah. And just that panic from the audience of, oh, all their votes matter. Everyone Mm -hmm. has to cast public opinion. And the crazy notion of, oh my God, Louis just admitted to killing the king. And yet the king is fine with him being successor if that's what the people choose. There's this Mm -hmm. bleakness to the whole thing. Of you really don't know what's happening where you do have the main characters have the mission of killing Louise in order to kind of revive the prince. But at the same time, with all of this going around, it's how does this factor, how does the public opinion actually contribute to the story moving forward? And again, everything so far seems like it's pretty contained, but at the At this point, it's, okay, now that this public opinion thing is out in the open, Mm -hmm. how do you stretch this into a 100-hour game? So I think it went from, okay, this is, you know, a standard story to, okay, this is a Atlas RPG, and I'm really excited to see how it unfolds, where, Mm -hmm. I don't know, Matt, it, it, it... and also, the Majora's Mask Moon is just a sight to behold. Yeah. And yeah. the fact that when you're kind of roaming around before you start the dungeon, there's that human in the background just kind of sitting there where, you know, even one of the NPCs says, is that thing just going to come up alive again? Like, can the army really stop it? Mm-hmm. So it really, in that specific scene, in that specific moment, it ups the ante so much. And I don't know, just made me excited to see where this game goes. But mm-hmm. that... Mm-hmm. Um, what else has caught your attention playing through the retail version of Metaphor? Uh, oh, Jaren, okay. I guess like, the thing that I was alluding to before, but just before that, Jaren, I like that all the um, Metaphor bosses, like the humans, are all apparently like based on like this like painter. I can't remember their name right now, but I was kind of like, mm-hmm. looking through a Polygon post. About how, hey, here's, here's like, one boss, and they're comparing it to, you know, all these paintings. I'm like, oh, neat. If I was That's if I was more cool. into art, I probably would get yeah. a lot out of this. That's pretty cool as well. But, um... Uh, hmm? Are you going to say, yeah? Uh, do you have a follow-up, or... Yeah, yeah, you need yeah, me to test? Okay, okay, yeah. okay. <clears throat> Aaron, like I said earlier, there's one thing that I really don't like about, um, I guess, metaphors, kind of, establishing of stuff in general Hmm. or establishing like hey like this is like how we want the game to flow in that during there is a boss in the kind of like second area of the game when you're in the cave um there's that kind of like dragon monster or there's the dragon and they have this kind of idea of hey you can avoid this monster or you can fight it i fought it man yeah I, i i fought it as well and you get like a very good item out of it yep and it does kind of like you know set up that establish of hey there's going to be difficult monsters in areas and i i i kind of like that sort of thing inside the sort of game because um this is like really where the archetype switching really really matters um there's another area in the game where you know there was a a another uh, monster in the field that i just I honestly couldn't beat, so I just ran away from it. And, you know, I, I, I took that loss. And then, Jared, in the second dungeon, there is another similar thing where, hey, you can stealth around it or you can fight it. Jared, you don't get anything for fighting this this boss. And it, it makes me so sad that, like, I put so much effort into beating this thing that I had to, uh, that I walked away with basically nothing. I walked away that with no MP. That should be illegal. Yeah, that was that was really really rough, and it was it was really disappointing for that sort of thing to like kind of like play out. Man, that's rough, Matt. Just because 
you know, I like fighting the dragon in that, in like the Northern Mines, just because Mm -hmm. when you run up to it, Grease is like, what the heck is your problem? We're supposed to sneak around with it. Like, we're not going to win. But Uh apparently there was a cool item and you get that really cool dragon sword that's purple. Mm -hmm. And I think this goes to what I've noticed as well in that... When you equipped it, I have it on stroll right now. Mm-hmm. And it's a six sword, Matt. Yeah. It looks cool. But at the same time, it's it doesn't show up in cutscenes a lot. It alternates yeah. between that and then alternates to Stroll's like basic sword. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why I haven't purchased any of the Atlas DLC for this game yet. Oh because man. Matt, mm-hmm. Jared, I was really tempted to buy the Persona 4 one. I was tempted to buy the Persona 4 one or the Persona 5 one just because, one, it comes with costumes for your characters, and two, it comes with background music. Mm -hmm. But then that, I looked into it, and it's one of those, you can't separately set the background music in that, one, these packs are $7 Canadian, too much. Yeah. Let's let's be honest, too much. Mm -hmm. Um. As someone who bought a bunch of voice packs from well, okay. Hawaii members earlier. They're too much for what they ended up being. If they were done proper, I think $7 yeah. I would have paid. Yeah. So here, here's my issue with $7. Mm-hmm. You only get one background music track. Yeah. And that background music track is tied to your character outfits. So mm-hmm. say I wanted to... I like the, the battle music that they chose for all the mainline... Or the more modern Persona games. Likewise, I only like the persona 4 uniforms just because Mm -hmm. persona 4 is a special place in my heart yeah now if you're saying the background music is attached to the outfits that's already a no-go because matt Mm -hmm. similar to the sword or you know your cosmetic weapons appearing in cutscenes, apparently the costumes themselves will only show up where you know the sword would show up or your weapons would show up where it doesn't show up in cutscenes proper, um, and you'll end up alternating between, oh, they're in the regular costume, oh, but for this brief second, they're in their school outfit. And I don't yeah. know, Matt. That's, I don't think the DLC is implemented well. If it was implemented, you know, if the tracks were separate, if you can set it to shuffle um, in the main menu, because I do like the metaphor battle theme as well, but if I can, you know, shuffle in uh, the P4 and Last Surprise from P5, I think that would be an easier sell. But for what it is, Matt, mm-hmm. no. If, yeah. if the outfits were consistent, sure, it might be kind of breaking to the lore, but mm, mm-hmm. not for me, Matt. Mm-hmm. Not for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, like, they showed up anywhere that they would have their default outfit, you know, like, I, yeah. I get that at some points they're going to be, you know, changing their outfit for story reasons and that's totally fine to you know get out of the the school uniform but if they're going to be in their default clothes and they're not going to be in the you know the what do you call it outfits that you you paid real ass money for that's really disappointing but yeah matt Mm -hmm. again i'm still 60 percent in the first dungeon you're i don't know what percentage you're at but i feel like you're if you're not midway you're still like 40 percent of the way there so still have a lot of game to play and mm-hmm. we'll do, you know, the weekly check-ins here on out. But I feel like eventually once we both finish the game, we can go into more specific story, character discussions, maybe in the future or as a vault episode. But mm-hmm. uh, not for now, any closing thoughts on the release of Metaphor Re Fantasio? Um, I mean, I, I really like the game so far. I think if, you know, you like Persona, you're probably gonna like this uh and i really really suggest checking it out because it is a very interesting take or like an interesting like little twist on the persona formula and again it's hard for me to play this game and not think how this will inform persona 6 in some ways and i'm really curious to see what is implemented here that will find itself in the in future persona games Mm -hmm. but jared matt what's Mm -hmm. up Sorry, one more thing that I yes. forgot about until really just now. Jaren, evasion is the strongest thing in this game. Hmm. I cannot believe it. Because Jaren, 
the I think it's like Sukunda and like that sort of line, you know, when you like raise your evasion or lower the enemies, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, uh, like chance to hit. Jaren, that is so ridiculously strong in this game because of losing turns. Missing right. is so devastating in this game because it yep. screws everything. And, you know, kind of just stacking that along with stacking enemy accuracy down is primo, primo like, cheese fighting. Um, and there's an item that you can buy in the shops that basically lets you cast it as a, okay. just an item thing. I need to look into that real soon, man. Oh, man. Real, real soon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, Matt, mm-hmm. before we close off, do you have one more hot Matt tip for Metaphor Re Fantasio to share? Ooh, one more hot th- Honestly, re- abuse the retry button in fights. Yes. that That is such a good button to use, and kind of surprisingly to me, you don't have the option to just restart when you die. Mm-hmm. Um... Like I'm surprised that you have to load back into a save instead of being able to restart, even though that button is like you know right there. Wait, really? Yeah. Like if you die in battle, you have to yeah. load back in. You're not able to use oh. the retry. And <laughs> I think worst of all, when you retry, you preserve any information the game gave about like, hey, they're weak to this or whatnot. Yeah. You don't get that if you load back in. Where <laughs> Matt? Mm-hmm. The moment I reflect. <laughs> Uh-huh. It's not restart the battle. Yeah. Because, again, reflecting ends your turn, and that's yeah. brutal in some cases mm-hmm. where, mm-hmm. you know, Matt, again, I'm not above it. I'll do my spell rotation just to see what hits and what doesn't, and then I'll just reset the battle. And oh, Jared, that reminds me of one more thing. Uh, a question I had last week, which is where if you hit somebody with weak and you also, you know, hit somebody with uh, block or, like, you miss... Yeah. Um. You lose the turns. You don't gain the uh, half turns. That I hate it, Matt. I hate mm. it here. Mm. But Matt, that's mm-hmm. metaphor re Fantasio for the week. Uh, this ended up being a beefy boy episode. Yes, certain, it did. Even though I said to you, Matt, this will be a less beefy <laughs> boy episode, but mm-hmm. can't end it off without a challenge, Matt. Please. Yes. So, Jaren, we are going to be doing a Don't Match Me Challenge. Um, You know, as always, the rules are that I'm going to ask five questions and I'm going to give five answers. All you have to do as a player is not match the answer that I give to my question. Um, Of course, you can play on a quote-unquote harder difficulty by also not matching my co-host Jaren here. And... Remember, as always, this is a a podcast, and uh, if you need more time to think of an answer, just pause us, because, you know, mm-hmm. we're, we're always going to be around through the magic of technology. So uh, magic. So mm-hmm, magic. Mm-hmm. And, Jaren, you know, because Metaphor Refantasio is still a bit new of a game, I decided to, you know, take a step back and go metaphor adjacent with my persona, Don't Match Me. Classic. Classic, Jaren, classic. So all these questions are going to be basically related to the Persona series. And starting it off right at the top, my first question is, name any non-mainline Persona game. So any spinoff game. Jaren, have we done a, a Persona one before? I feel like we have. Not if we did, I forgot it because I'm an old man okay. and forget <laughs> okay. everything. Okay. I know we've met. Mm-hmm. I know we've done RPGs before. We probably did a Persona, but not, mm, who cares? Okay. <laughs> round two. Mm-hmm. Round two. Mm-hmm. Okay. Again, so that first question is, name any non-mainline Persona game or any, you know, spin-off Persona game. So, name that game in three, two, one. I'm going with the pretty recent Persona 5 Tactica. Oh, nice. Matt, mm-hmm. I went with Persona Q. Ooh, Okay, good game, good game, good game, good game. Good game, good game. Mm -hmm. So, going on to my second question. Of course, you know, very important in Persona is the Arcanas. All I want you to do is name any Arcana. Any Arcana. So, name that Arcana in three, two, one. I'm going with one that I've I've liked through, you know, three, four, and five. The Hermit Arcana. Oh, Good mm-hmm. her- Arcana, Matt. Good Arcana. Good Arcana. Matt, Good Arcana. I went 
with the devil arcana mm. the, mm-hmm. shout out to the nurse in for some shout out to the, nurse. Shout out to the yep that's yep. the first one i thought of <laughs> yeah oh man all right jared uh and listener my my third question is name any velvet room attendant Ooh. any attendant it, that's been in a you know persona velvet room name that attendant in three two one i'm going with the kind of edge case here i'm going with merope from the persona 5x game the the persona gotcha game matt mm-hmm. i'm going with theodore from hey. persona 3 portable hey that guy that guy that Jared? guy I did What's not up? know uh, until I like you know was looking up just uh, characters for for this uh, Velvet Room thing and the uh, uh, the Arcana question. I didn't realize how many S links changed for uh, the FEMC. Yeah, like no, I was I, very surprised to see that even Hermit changed for the FEMC in Persona Three. Yeah, they did shuffle around, but man, I'll always mm. die. Uh, that will always be the hell I'll die on. I loved. <laughs> The FEMC route in Persona 3 Portable. Please mm-hmm. bring her back, Atlas. Please bring mm-hmm. her back. No, nah, not a real character. Not canon. Not canon. <laughs> makes me sad. That makes me sad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, you know, going back to uh, the Don't Matter Challenge, my my fourth question is, you know, Persona, we talked about this on our last, uh, what do you call it, Metaphor Refantasio episode, but... We were very bonded to see that the names for the elements changed in uh, yeah. Metaphor Refantasia. So I just want the name of any elemental base, like the base level magic uh, element in, in the Persona games. So name any elemental base magic in Persona in three, two, one. I'm going with Frey for the nuclear uh, element. Oh, Matt? Mm-hmm. I'm going with Garu hey. for the wind. Hey. A classic, the classic, the classic. Yep. And you know my my fifth and final question for this uh, persona based don't match me challenge is name any new game plus exclusive persona boss. Ooh. So any boss that you can only face in new game plus in you know whichever game that you face them in. So name that boss. In three, two, one, I'm going with Margaret. Not mm-hmm. when you say Margaret, uh-huh. <laughs> because I I too said Margaret. Uh-huh. So Matt, uh-huh. which Margaret are you talking about? I mean, I was talking about just the kind of like base P4 Margaret fight because that was the if new I game s- plus one, right? That if I said the P3 P Margaret fight, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do I do I scrape by or do I, I think lose? You scrape by, Jared. I didn't know that that was a fight you could do. I think that I think that counts as a different one. Wait, Matt. Mm-hmm. I think I lose. <laughs> I I don't think Margaret in P three P. You can fight Margaret in P three P, but I I don't think she's a new game plus boss. Oh, I see. I see. Oh man, Jared. Damn. I, I thought I could scrape by with a technicality there. Ooh, out on a different technicality. <laughs> Damn, so close, Matt. So, so close, close. So close, so close. So close. Oh, man. Matt, if you said a Velvet Room attended boss, <laughs> maybe. But not today, Matt. Not oh, today. Man. I have fallen in the fifth round. Hopefully, mm-hmm. hopefully our friends made it through, Matt. Mm-hmm. Out of curiosity, do you know what other New Game Plus boss fights there are? Um, there's basically any of the Velvet Room attendants. Like, Lavenza mm-hmm. is, a, I'm pretty sure, a New Game Plus exclusive elizabeth is a new game plus exclusive um i was actually very surprised that in persona 3 death is a new game plus exclusive really yeah huh he doesn't start showing up um until like you get you're a new game plus man you can fight margaret in p3p that's pretty cool man I did, yeah i didn't know there was a boss fight in there Jared. <laughs> i loved p3p matt mm-hmm <laughs> I'd rather pay like P three P than reload, <laughs> which speaks volumes. But uh, Matt, mm-hmm. hopefully our friends made it through, unlike myself. But once mm-hmm. again, Matt, another beefy boy episode. But as always, did it uh, at the top of the hour. But I want to thank you as always for joining me this week. 
uh, editing this podcast, bringing the metaphor knowledge, and of course, don't match me this week. Hey, thanks, man. Jaron, I want to, you know, as always, thank you for hosting the show and, you know, reminiscing with me about how good it was to to jam jam on sushi. Matt? Mm-hmm. Want to thank sushi? Mm-hmm. Want to thank the hiragana characters for sushi? Yeah. Matt? Mm-hmm. No, those are by heart right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt? Uh-huh. Want to thank Elizabeth, Nerissa, Crony, <laughs> Zeta, Rene, Yofi, and Risu? Oh, man. Matt? Jared. Love Anya. Don't want to thank Anya this week, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. Jared, the Hololive shop got you. <laughs> want to thank Ollie, as always. And mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to thank Fabian. And I hope she becomes playable in my party. <laughs> Ooh, maybe. Jared, uh, I wouldn't be surprised t- if somehow this game ends with like you just recruiting a bunch of people to your cause using the, the what do you call it? Archetype granting uh, ability. That would be pretty good, Matt. Pretty good. But we'll see Mm -hmm. in one of our future check-ins. But until then, Matt, please take it away. This has been the Mistake Zone, and we're all out of Grius Death Flags. So many, Matt. So many.